The following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. You guys doing good? Come on, how you doing? What is going on? God is good. He's on the throne. And I was just gifted. We just did a series on 2020 Vision. How many of you guys, has anybody enjoyed the series on 2020 Vision? We talked about all kinds of perspective for your life. And I was just gifted with a, with a, with a living illustration. Yes. 2020 Vision. This is what it's about, guys. And I wish I could say everybody leaving here today will leave with a pair of these. Unfortunately, I only have one. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're going to give this away to a prize winner later on. In fact, we can do that even now. Who came the furthest today? Who came the furthest today to our service? Who thinks they came the furthest? Come on, you got to raise your hand. Shout out where you're from. Where? Canyon Country. That's far. Anybody further? Further than Canyon Country. Go in once. Silmar. Canyon Country is further. Anybody else? Where? Where? Oh, that's right. Where'd you come from? Ethiopia? Yeah. You came to Ethiopia. All right. He just, he just came to town. Awesome. You get that? 2020 vision. You are fully in style. Um, no, but anyway, guys, we've been doing this really cool series on 2020 vision. And if you uh, uh, care about vision, and you should, this is a great time to get a reset in your life. But not only for the year, but for the decade, to literally get perspective on how to see things and and, and what's your mission and what you were made for. And we looked at a lot of really cool components of that. I encourage you, if you haven't caught up on that, check out our YouTube channel. This is a great series. And although that um, series is technically over, I was really praying this week uh, on this topic. And I felt the Lord reminding me uh, to, to, to teach people about his worldview. Everyone say worldview. See, when it comes to worldview, everybody has their own worldview. Uh, and the worldview starts in your life ever since you're, you're little. When you're a little kid and somebody pulls a toy away from you in the sandbox, um, you start to go, wait a second, everyone's not nice, right? You've, everybody had this experience? Um, and as you go through, you look, at, you look at life through a lens, and everyone seems to have their own lens, uh, the way they see life. It's their worldview, Uh, But your worldview matters a lot. It matters to God. Um, Your worldview uh, determines the way you not only see the world, it determines how you see yourself in this world. That's your worldview. Uh, It determines how you see others. You see others through your worldview from your perspective. Um, And you also see your purpose through this lens of worldview. What is your worldview? And everyone's got a different worldview worldview. But, but here's the thing. God has a worldview also. And how many of you know that his ways are higher than ours as much as the heaven is above the earth? God has the ultimate worldview. He knows design. He knows purpose. He knows your DNA. He, he created you long ago before you took your first breath, first breath with plans and purpose. So God has the ultimate worldview. He's all-knowing. And this is what happens. When you begin to follow Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, starts walking out the ways of the Father. Uh, Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's doing the will of the Father. He's loving. He's teaching. And as you begin to follow Jesus, uh, if you're like me, your worldview begins to change. Has anybody noticed that in their life, that your worldview begins to change? Yeah, the way, when I read Jesus specifically in Scripture, and I experience what he does in our lives, I realize, wow, he's, he's changing my worldview He's helping me see things differently. And God knows I need to see things differently. And so today my prayer and my hope is that his worldview becomes your worldview. That God's worldview becomes our worldview. That we begin to look through this lens of God. How should I view these times that we're in? How should I view others? How should I view myself? How should I view setbacks and opportunities? How should I view these things, God? I want your worldview. We sing that song. Well, some people sing that song, open the eyes of my heart, right? Lord, I want to see. I want to see you. I want to see what you can show me, God. And so worldview matters uh, monumentally. And we're going to be looking at that today. In fact, what's amazing about this is Jesus comes to town and people start following him and he starts teaching and revealing 
the view of the Father, the worldview. He begins to say, you say this, but the kingdom is like this. And all through scripture, he's saying, if you think that's your worldview, let me give you an adjustment because this is the, the, opt, the optimal way to look at life through the lens of God, through things that matter, the things that have purpose, through things that are eternal, for, through things that will actually bear fruit because so many things in our worldview don't really bear fruit. And so um, we're going to look today in Matthew chapter 9. If you guys have your Bible, if you could turn there, Matthew chapter 9, or on your device, however you read your word. Um, and we're looking at today something that is monumental in the worldview of God. In, through God's worldview, this is monumental. And in our worldview, I don't think it's super monumental. To some of you, it may be. Uh, to some of you, you like the idea, the principle. Uh, but actually, I don't know that we're living our life through this worldview. And, and the specific worldview we're talking about today is the harvest. Everyone say the harvest. The Bible has a lot to say about the harvest. God wants you to know his heart and his view of the harvest. And I think today what he wants to shift in us is, is for his view to become our view. That if we have God's worldview regarding the harvest, I think we're going to leave here changed people today. And so I want to focus on the harvest. I want to focus on some of the things Jesus says about the harvest that you and I would go, oh, I didn't exactly look at it that way. And, and hopefully leaving here today, we're going to walk out of here looking at the harvest completely different and God will change our worldview in a great way. So it says this, we're going to jump in, uh, picking up in verse 35. Um, and Jesus says this, it says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, this is a passage uh, many of you have read before and you've heard before. Uh, so some of you are quite familiar with this. But I want us to look at it today through the worldview, the lens, the eyes of God, and what he's trying to show us that, that will become personal to us not just another story in the Bible, uh, but something that will come alive and become personal to us all because I do believe that's God's heart for everyone today. He's asking us, specifically living in the times we're living in, uh, he has you here for such a time as this. We're living in times of prophetic fulfillment. Um, you'll be hearing from Tom uh, in a couple few weeks from now and he's gonna look at some signs of the times and indications to show, look, these are facts about where we're living historically that no other generation could have lived in the times we are that are actually in the Bible. So we're living in prophetic times, and guess what? God designed you, designed you to be here on this planet in these prophetic times. You could have been born in any season in the history of humanity, and you barely would have seen change. But now change is coming at a rapid rate. It's unprecedented. It's exponentially blowing up as far as change. And God wanted you here in this season. And that's why it's so important that you and I not only recognize who we are, we need to know whose we are, and we need to start looking at life through his lens, literally. We need to be looking at the world through the worldview of God. Otherwise, we will get uh, sidetracked and we'll miss out completely on the importance of the moment. Uh, the times that we're in and the opportunities we have. We'll miss out on them because we'll be looking at the wrong things and we'll be looking through the wrong lens. And so Jesus focuses here uh, and he's sharing God's worldview in this passage and, and literally through the eyes of Jesus. Jesus is talking and he's like, let me tell you what I see. And, and the gospel's being written down. Jesus is like, this is what I see. And, and, and so we have this amazing account of it. So he was teaching and preaching and healing in all of the towns. Um, but, but here's the thing, there's a way things look on the outside. You can look at things on the outside. You can look at the hills, the country, you can look at the weather, uh, you look at people, see the way they're dressed. You can look at things on the outside, but, but the passage jumps really quickly into something much deeper than the outside. Uh, because God's worldview, how many of you know that God doesn't look at the outside? You know God doesn't look at the outside, he looks at the inside. Something the Pharisees never understood. They always had it wrong. 
And if we're overly religious, we'll be in that camp too. We'll look at the outside. We'll completely miss completely the lens of God. Jesus is walking through the town. Yes, he's healing, he's preaching, and he's teaching, but, but he really looked at the people. He looked at the people. And as he's going, he's like looking at the people like really intently. And he's like, wow, I see something profound. And he says what it is. He looked at the people On the outside, they might look one way, but he said on the inside, they were harassed and helpless. Harassed and helpless. That's a pretty profound description. Harassed and helpless. Um, He's referring to this, obviously, through the lens of a shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd. Referring to people, we are like sheep, the Bible says. We all go astray. Sheep are kind of dumb sometimes. They think they know what they're doing and then they start eating and then they're eating away from their friends and before you know it, they're over some hill or fell off a cliff or did something. This is just what sheep do um, by nature. And the Bible says we all like sheep have gone astray. We all just kind of drift and do our own thing. So that's common with humanity. And in that sense, we are in fact like sheep. But Jesus is saying on the outside, there's one look. But on the inside, from what I'm seeing through the worldview, through the lens of God, what I am seeing is that people are harassed and helpless. And this has given us this picture of people on the inside, everyone say on the inside, being weary and worn out. People are weary and worn out. They're harassed and helpless. They're powerless and vulnerable. This is what Jesus is saying. He's like, wow, this is the true condition of people. No matter what they look like on the outside, Jesus was seeing. And there's nothing worse than being powerless and vulnerable. There's nothing worse than that. Um, You know, for a sheep, there's nothing worse than that, and that's kind of the context. But for for people in life, there's nothing worse than being powerless and vulnerable. It's kind of like being, uh, you got to go to school every day, and the bully's going to be there again. And you got to show up, and guess what? The bully's going to be there. And you go, great, here we go. Because when you go back, (sighs) powerless and vulnerable, maybe over the situation, or whatever that might be in life, Jesus is saying spiritually, that's what's going on here. People are going through life, harassed and helpless, powerless and vulnerable, and there's this outstanding thing just waiting there, almost like the way it happens in Scripture with shepherds and sheep. This is the context where a sheep wanders off, or or sometimes the sheep can be in a group, and maybe the shepherd is over there sleeping, but a wolf comes around, a wolf comes around. So we're really not talking about a bully beating people up on the outside. We're talking about the enemy who comes around and tries to harass the sheep. They're all running, they're scared, their hearts... They're ready to have a heart attack, and he just finds one, just one is all he needs that night, and takes, takes it out, takes it out. But guess what? He comes back again another night, and the same thing happens, and the sheep are harassed and helpless. They are powerless and vulnerable, and Jesus is saying, that's what I see inside of people, because Jesus understands the spiritual climate of life, eternity, and everything, and he's like, wow, look what's going on on the inside. So what's happening to people then is also what happens to people now. I believe if you were walking down the street with Jesus, Jesus would tell us the same thing today. There's something about the human condition that doesn't change over time. How many of you know the human condition has not evolved, the nature of people? There is no evolution of the human soul. There is no evolution of the thought. We've been thinking, you look at uh, first century Greek and the, and the scholars and the things they're saying, and the, um, you, you look at some of these Greek philosophers, and they've got some pretty brilliant arguments, and, and, and intellect is rolling. Here we are 2,000 years later. The, 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 the intentions are the same. The motives of man are the same. The excuses are the same. The attitudes of the heart are the same. The nature of people on on the inside and their need is the same. So Jesus has given us a timeless message right here. And and, and what he wants us to know, and I want to encourage you to just write down five things today. And it has to do with God's worldview becoming your worldview. And it's centered today on the harvest specifically. And and if, if the first one is this, the harvest which is the, the, the people all around you on your block, the work, the harvest is everywhere. The harvest, number one, is perplexed. They're perplexed. They're harassed. They're helpless. They're powerless. They're vulnerable. They're weary. They're worn out. They're the harvest. They don't have the answer. They don't have the solution. They don't have the peace, the joy, the eternal security, none of the above. They're, they're, they're perplexed. They're turmoiled on the inside. That's the worldview of God looking at humanity, if people really came to to understand their inner condition, he's like, this is what I see, and this is what you should see. Um, 
people, the harvest is perplexed. And again, it's worry and fear and hurt and harassment and helpless. You know, there's a lot of things we do in life that put us in this category. Sometimes we don't understand what it is. But the other parables, we, we referred to them last week in Luke's gospel. Um, there's a parable of a, a lost coin that talks about the harvest and reaching people. And, and, and the context is like, you didn't mean to lose it, but somehow, some way, that valuable coin fell out of your hand and you lost it. And so some of us in life, like, well, we didn't mean to do that. Like, we didn't mean something bad, but guess what? We, we lost what is valuable. And people go through life losing things of value. There's also a story of a lost son in the story. And like, I, I didn't mean to lose. How did that happen? What happened? And people, by, by sometimes no direct intention, wander or lose things and, and, and get in this place of hurt and harassment and helpless. And Jesus is saying what people really need in this, because we're all like sheep, they really need the great shepherd. See, Jesus will not let you be harassed this way. There are limitations uh, that, that can't happen to you when you're a Christ follower. And, and I'm not saying some of the things we see you know, in nature and the natural things happen to, uh, the Bible says the, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. But you gotta know that, that when you serve the King of Kings, when Jesus is your Lord, Do you know hell has to go through Jesus first? Do you you know that? Hell needs to, even in the story of Job, when he was about to go through things, hell could not touch him and had to say, can I have permission for this minute? It's a rare, rare instance in scripture. We don't see this happening multiple times. We see this rare instance where hell couldn't even bother him in this context. Um, and, and so there was a purpose in it. But that being said, that when you serve the king, you, you, you are under the protection of the great shepherd. When you are a son and daughter of God, when you become a follower of Jesus, you enter the kingdom of God, the realm of God. And when you're in the kingdom of God, you have privileges and protections and benefits of the kingdom of God. And part of that is not just his provision, part of that's his protection. And he looks at people and he's like, they are just so helpless because they're completely outside of my protection. And, and they're perplexed. And they don't even know they're outside of my protection. And Jesus sees this in the eyes of people all around him. So the harvest is, in fact, perplexed. The next thing Jesus reminds the disciples, it's another important thing that God wants us to see. And it has to do with the value. Everyone say value. The value that we place on the harvest. Because the harvest oftentimes is the concept of, well, of course people need the Lord. They should hear the gospel. I know in theory they should. I believe that doctrinally, theologically. Yeah, that's a good. But, but do we personally place a high value on it? Now, this is something where in our own personal worldview, maybe we don't, if we were honest. And if we did, it would be very evident by our lifestyle. See, we can believe it and, and acknowledge the principle, and that's wonderful, but it doesn't really mean, it, mean it's our worldview. Uh, but when we start to walk it out and live it, it's like, well, obviously it is our worldview. And, and Jesus wants us to know something else about this, this harvest. This harvest has a profoundly, profoundly high value. The value of the harvest is so high, so high, that Jesus is referring to God as the Lord of the harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. Jesus is not Lord of things that have no value. Jesus is, God is not uh, the, the Lord of things that are inconsequential. He, he's the Lord of things that matter. And he's saying this harvest matters a lot. Every one of them, every person, no matter how they're living, what they're doing, no matter how many mistakes and how many times they fell down and how many choices they made, it doesn't matter God says they are so valuable, and that's why he's being, refer, being referred to as the Lord of the harvest. When, when he's the Lord of the harvest, it kind of forces us or helps us to see the harvest the way we ought to be seeing the harvest with profound value. And so the second point is that the harvest is not just perplexed. The harvest at the same time is precious. The harvest is precious in the eyes of God, and that's why he is the Lord of the harvest. And Jesus is trying to give us the worldview, saying, take these off of me and put them on you. Do you see what I see? The, the, these people who think they're trying to get through life and get somewhere with their own worldview, they're harassed and they're perplexed. 
And the enemy's chasing people down and has people running in circles and weighed down and wearied and burdened and all kinds of things. But, but he said, guess what? They're precious to me. They're precious to me. Um, and so then Jesus moves. Uh, he sees the harvest and, he, and he's moved with compassion. Ironically, the Greek word here for compassion used in this passage right here is this profound level of pity that is not really found in other Greek writing at the time. It's almost as the apostles writing the scripture are going, we don't have a heavy enough word for this. Uh, it, it's kind of that context when you read some commentators. They're like, this word is kind of unique. It's such, such a heavy feeling. He just didn't look and go, yeah, I got compassion for those guys. And keep. He looked and he's like, oh, man. He, he looked, he saw. But listen, compassion doesn't just look and see. Compassion feels. Compassion feels. And he looked and he saw but he didn't stop there and keep walking, make a little narrative, a comment. Hey, write that down, guys. We're going to the next town. He looked, and it broke his heart. He felt the weight of it. You know, the the Greek word for mercy has the connotation of actually, get literally, this graphic, getting under someone else's skin. Getting under their skin. Now, that sounds profoundly odd from a natural sense, but from a a matter of what's going on in their soul, it's actually a spiritually brilliant sense. To come alongside, to have come back, to literally feel what they're feeling and go, oh my goodness, this poor guy or this poor girl, they're, they're weighed down, whoa, whoa. But we can look at it objectively and go, oh, poor them, or we can pray for them. But, but when you see and you have compassion, you begin to feel the weight And that's what Jesus did. And that's why this word is such a profound word used here. Jesus looked and he had this compassion. His heart's like, oh, it's hard to move on to the next town when this is the reality of the human condition. And he's telling the disciples, look, this harvest, it matters. He's saying, I want my worldview to be your worldview. Please understand the harvest is precious. So, So Jesus wants us guys not just to see the need. Jesus wants us to feel the need, amen? Feel the need. When you start feeling the need, then you're taking on the worldview of God. And if you only see the need, then we're not quite there yet. We like the worldview of God. We appreciate the principle, but we haven't taken it on yet. But when you feel the need and we start having compassion on the harvest, then we're taking on, literally taking on the worldview of God. The next thing that Jesus says is not only that the harvest is perplexed and yet so precious at the same time, he says the harvest is plentiful. That's our third point this, this morning. It's plentiful, plentiful. Now, here's what you've got to know about a plentiful harvest. A plentiful harvest is not something where you walk through a, 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 a grove of oranges, for example, and go, oh, here's one here, or here's one here. Um, ripe for harvest means there's a lot more fruit ready to be harvested than you have any idea. And I believe that's the case all around you and I, especially in the times we're living in. There is much more harvest ready to be had, but we don't fully engage it. Uh, We don't fully walk the harvest fields, or or we don't walk through the harvest fields with this lens, this worldview of God. Most of us don't. Uh, we, We like it, or maybe we send a missionary to do that, or an evangelist. But we don't really walk this out, which is for um, all believers. The harvest is plentiful. There are 7 billion people on planet Earth. There are 1 billion people living in poverty. There are 150 million orphans on this planet. And there are billions, billions who have never even heard the gospel. Never even heard it. Never even heard it. And God wants to see that this harvest around us is actually abundant. It's abundant. Uh, What he's saying, there are more people out there that are ripe and willing than you can count. There are more people that are ripe and willing and open than you or I can count. Now, sometimes we don't think that and we don't know that and we don't engage in that. We just kind of stay in our lane. But I think he wants us to know his worldview to become ours. If he says the fields are ripe, ripe for harvest, That means the fields are ripe for harvest, the harvest fields. There's so much more people ready than you know, than you've ever imagined. This is what he's saying. And Jesus wants us to help rescue and restore every single one of those. This is the lens of God. This is the worldview of God. This is our place in his 
grand scheme of things. Yes, be redeemed. Have a love relationship with God because Jesus takes away our sins. We believe he came, died on a cross, removed, paid for the price of sins. And by faith, we receive that and we turn and we begin to follow. But listen, we don't just begin to follow to have a happy life and stay in our lane and do our own thing and get as blessed as we can. We do it so we can walk with Jesus and go on mission with him and walk out the things he made us to do. And this is part of the worldview that God is telling us to, to see it first, first see it, and then if you see it, will you embrace it? Will you see it and will you, will you feel it? And this is what he's saying right here. So uh, here's another scripture that builds on this theme from John 4, 35. I love, this is one of my favorite passages in scripture in John chapter four. Uh, and he tells the disciples this, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Uh, This is said in the context of Jesus going to a woman at the well in Samaria who was living a crazy lifestyle and and, and didn't even want to be hanging around with other women in public because other women didn't want to hang around with her either. So this woman is living because of the choices she made and the stuff she went through. Um, She was living life solo, uh, going into relationship after relationship after relationship, and none of it was fixing the internal problem. Because how many of you know a relationship won't fix the internal problem? Only a relationship God begins to fix the internal problem. And this woman didn't know that, but Jesus didn't judge her. Jesus had compassion on her, and he began to speak words of life to her. And this woman was so profoundly moved and changed by Jesus that she, after this encounter with Jesus, she goes back to her town to people she wouldn't normally talk to and says, guys, I met the one. I met the one who changed my life and you got to meet him too. And all of a sudden, this whole town starts walking out to come and see Jesus. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, guys, the harvest field, it's plentiful. (laughs) It's ripe. So much more ripe than you have any idea. And they're looking around going, what's he talking about? I don't know what Jesus is talking about. And he's like, stay tuned. And before you know it, this whole town of people comes walking out to see Jesus. But God wants us to see what he sees, that the harvest is ripe and is ready right now. And, and when, what, what happens uh, when things, this is important, guys, and I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but when things are not harvested, has, have any of you ever had a, an orange tree or anything with any kind of fruit? How many in the room have had anything in their life with some kind of fruit on it? whether it's grapes or just anything. Okay, tomatoes, whatever. What happens when it is not harvested? Ouch. Yeah. When it's not harvested, because it was made to be harvested, when it's not harvested, it begins to shrivel up, dry out. Sometimes birds come and eat it. Falls, hits the ground, splat. All All these things happen. It essentially, it dies. It dies. It wasn't made to die. It was made to be enjoyed. It was made to bear fruit. But, but in the meantime, it's not. And there's one reason it's not. It's because it was never, it was simply never harvested. It was never harvested. When Jesus is telling you and I to look at the harvest fields, this is profound. Look at the harvest fields. Do you see it? And some are like, no, I don't really see it. Keep looking. Look. Do you see it? Okay, now I do. Good. Do you feel it yet? No, not yet. Okay, get God's worldview. You're going to start feeling it. And guess what? When you really see it for what it is, this harvest, if it's not harvested, sadly, those in the harvest field will die. And Jesus says that spiritually to be the case. Those will die if they're not harvested. This is really, really important. So if you're a note taker, write this one down. Not only is the harvest perplexed and yet so precious to God at the same time, not only is the harvest so plentiful, but listen, the harvest, guys, the harvest is perishing. The harvest is perishing, and that's hard news. That's hard news. That's not fun news, but it's a reality check. As you and I, as Christ followers, go through our life, living our thing, doing our thing, going after our pursuits and whatever we're doing, I get it, we all do that. But if we don't understand the worldview of God, we're gonna miss out on this heart. We're gonna agree with the principle, and we're gonna agree with those who happen to be engaged in it. But we're not gonna really feel it, and we're not gonna take it on, and we're not gonna walk it out And we're not going to really even feel the weight of the fact that not only are they precious and perplexed, but guess what? They are perishing. And how many of you know that Jesus said that none would perish? That's an aim of Jesus. That's a priority of Jesus. Jesus said, 
I, I came that none would perish. I don't want anyone, not a single one. Well, what about that person that's, I don't want him to perish either. Well, what about that girl who, you know, I don't want her to perish either. Well, what about, I don't want anyone to perish. I want everyone's redeemable in the eyes of Jesus, and, and he, he wants none to perish. And so when you look at the harvest field, you're like, oh, it, you mean to say that if people, if we don't engage this somehow or somebody doesn't, that, that there's this outstanding monumental factor of harvests that are not harvested perish? Yes, that's what Jesus is saying. That's the context of Scripture of, of when it comes to harvest and engagement. So it's really, really important. So um, the last point is this, guys. Not only is the harvest perplexed and precious and plentiful, yet perishing at the same time, Jesus reminds us the last point, and it's this. The harvest is priority, priority. Hey, if the harvest weren't perishing, maybe it wouldn't be a priority, but the harvest is perishing. And the Bible says, how will they ever know? How will the, how will the billions of people on this planet ever even know unless someone tells them? Scripture says they won't know unless someone tells them. We want to just pray and give it to God. God's like, I will do my part. I'm the sovereign one. But listen, I want you to do your part and walk this thing out. Because all Christ followers were called to walk this thing out. The harvest is priority. Um, And then Jesus says, this is the last thing he says. And uh, he starts talking about, here's the problem with this whole thing. Harvest is perplexed and precious at the same time. And the harvest is, um, it's perishing and harvest is a priority, but here is the glaring problem. Why, why isn't this all happening then, if all of these things are true? If this is God's worldview that he wants to be ours, then why isn't, why isn't it just happening? Why aren't we all into the harvest field? And why aren't things changing all around us? And Jesus is like, because there's a glaring problem. Quite simply, there are not enough harvest workers. That's the problem. It's not God, it's not people. It's, there's not enough harvest workers. That's what Jesus says is the problem to this. You might have a different theological view. Well, God handles everything all the time. Well, he does, but Jesus is saying the problem with this is that there are not enough harvest workers. That's Jesus' words. We can't spin it. We can't make it up. Jesus said that's the problem. That's the problem. And, and there are many believe, Jesus would say, there are many that believe, but there are not many who do the work. Many believe, but not many do the work. Uh, and this is God's worldview on this, so it should be our worldview. And this is an important thing if you take one thing home away about the harvest. And what does this have to do with me? Pastor B, I came today, and what does this have to do with me? What it has to do with you is God wants his worldview to be your worldview. He wants you to know that today. He loves you. He has so much more for you. You can only enter in it if you start taking on his worldview. And if you're like me, I haven't arrived. I constantly have to take my worldview and put it to the side and put on his. I haven't arrived. Anybody else still working on God's worldview in the room? We're working on his worldview, okay? We're being, with the renewing of our mind, we're being transformed, we're being conformed into his image. None of us have arrived. This is this process of sanctification. Part of that is taking off our worldview and putting on God's worldview. It's a very important component. And Jesus is saying, if you begin to see what I see, then understand there's many believers, but not many workers. There's many believers, listen, many believers who have not yet, for some unknown reason, there are many believers who have not yet stepped into the work. Jesus said that's the problem. It's a precious harvest. Uh, They're perplexed. They're harassed. Uh, God is the Lord of the harvest. They are so valuable. Uh, They are perishing when no one engages. They are a priority. But here's the problem. It's not that people don't believe. It's that people aren't workers of the harvest. And this may be a category where God is calling you this morning to step into his work. God is calling you to step into his work. When you are a follower of Christ, when you call him Lord, and if you do call him Lord, uh, the Bible refers to us as his servants. We're servants of Christ. I'm a servant of Christ. I don't ever elevate myself like rank and file. I'm a pastor. You know, I'll plug in cords. I'll sweep the floor when we leave here. I'm, nothing is above me, um, and it can't be. If you're serving Jesus, things can't be above, you, you know, below you, excuse me. You can't say, well, that's below me. Uh, we're servants of Christ. Amen. Would you guys agree with that statement? We're servants of Christ. So being a servant of Christ, it, it assumes we step into his work. 
And so I want to encourage you this morning, if you believe, but you haven't stepped into his work, uh, maybe that's the, uh, the, the glaring truth to this passage today about God's worldview. It's not about knowing about it. It's really about stepping into um, his work. And that's what's uh, going on right here is to step into his work. The problem is there's not enough harvest workers. And Jesus says this, here's a solution to the glaring problem. Uh, pray to the Lord of harvest that he will send workers, workers into his harvest field. Again, there's a lot of believers, but not a lot of workers. Pray that the Father will send uh, people into the harvest field. And what happens, I don't know if you've known this, when you start praying about stuff, uh, you're communicating with God, you're asking God, but how many of you have sensed God start to knock on your heart while you're praying for something? Yeah, uh, sometimes we're communicating with God, we're asking for something, and God's like, I hear you, but what about you? What if we're praying for a solution and you are the solution? You don't think God loves you enough to let you know that? If you're open, if you're open to that? God, please, God, send a worker into the harvest field, God. Send somebody out there. What about you? Oh, Lord, send somebody out there. What about you? Oh, snap. Did God just say that? Did he say, what about me? Yes. What about you? Oh, let me keep praying. What do, you, what do you do with that? We can believe or we can step in. We can believe or we can be workers. We can believe in the principle, the context, the doctrine, the philosophy, uh, all these aspects of how God's kingdom works and what is good and what is sound doctrine. And we can do that till we go to the grave and miss out on the full engagement that God had all along saying, I care about the harvest. Would you please put my glasses on? Don't just see it, feel it. Now, the glaring problem is, I know you believe it, but will you step into it? Oh, me? Like literally me? Yes, literally you, because it gets profound when you do. It gets profound when you do. Isaiah said the same thing. He had this moment of prayer encounter with God, and he finally is in this context going, all right, it's pretty glaring obvious what I need to do. He goes, God, okay, you got me. Here I am, send me. Here I am, God, send me. I don't know who else is willing to go, but here am I, send me. And God's like, wow, you're going to get to see some amazing things, Isaiah, because you're willing to walk with me in, the, in my work, in things that matter to me, in things that are my worldview. You're willing to take on my worldview, not just see it, but feel it and walk it out. It's where it gets really profound. In fact, I, I, my prayer today is that we will see ourselves in this same lens. We will see ourselves the way God sees us. See, God sees you this morning, whether you know it or not. If you're a Christ follower, if you believe in Jesus, if you would say you're a follower, he sees you as an ambassador, an ambassador of Christ, an ambassador. Now, ambassadors, if you have been watching the news lately, ambassadors are in the news, um, but, but ambassadors uh, are somebody who is sent to another nation specifically with authority to communicate certain things on behalf of the one who sent them. So if our nation sends an ambassador to another nation, that ambassador gets information and goes over and communicates. They don't make up their own stuff. They communicate what was given to them. And they show up with authority. They show up with the authority of the one who sent them. Jesus says that you are, the Bible says that you are an ambassador for Christ. So that you are sent with the authority of the one who sent you. And I don't know if you know that or not, but you will not know that unless you step out into this stuff. When you begin to step out into this stuff, you begin to see that's true. There really is an authority. The, the Greek word is exousia. There's a couple of words for power. One's the dynamite power. One's the exousia power. This is this exousia authority power. You have an authority, and some of you have never even test drove it. You never even test drove the authority you have. You never did, and maybe you never will unless you step into the work. And when you do, you test drive the authority. You go, here goes God. You said it. I'm going to do it. And you watch what he does. That's why he tells people, listen, when you, when you get in front of people and you have to say something, don't worry about it. Don't panic. I will give you the words. You guys have read this in scripture, right? I will, give, I will show you what to say. I'll tell you what to say. And you're like, How's that going to work? And we're afraid to try it out. But if you're willing to step into the work, you will see that God will do exactly that. He will give you the words. He will compel you. He will put you in times and places and strategic things, divine appointments for you to engage in this harvest. That's what you're made for. All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me and I'm sending you in it. Therefore, go. Therefore, go. 
His last words to the, to the church was, therefore, go. Go. Not just believe. Go. You believe already. You walk with me for three years, disciples. I get it. You understand. You pray. You understand what the kingdom is about, what it's not about. Wonderful. Now, go. There's engagement time. And I want to encourage you guys. Maybe that's the glaring issue today. I see the harvest. Maybe I don't feel it. Help me feel it. But maybe it's time for me to step into this. I know when I stepped into this, it changed my life. It changed my life. Going into jails, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to say. What am I going to say to, you know, a room full of, you know, 300 convicted felons? What do I got to say? Hey, what's up? How you guys doing? You know, what do I got to say? I'm like, you know, I'm like, Lord, would you give me something to say? Like, I don't know what you want to tell these guys. And you just pray up a little bit and God says, tell them about, tell them about real freedom. Real freedom that they can have. Not bars and concrete. Real freedom on the inside that drove them to do the stuff they did in the first place. Oh. That's good, that's good, that's good. He'll give you the things to say. And when you test out his authority, test out his authority. I remember this one time, um, I went out to Chino to this penitentiary, and uh, you know, at the end, this one gangster guy came up, tatted everywhere, teardrops all the way down for the stretches he's, he's doing. Uh, he came, he's a big dude. He, he came up to me, and he got right in my face, and I'm like, Lord, what do I do? Do I, like, do I step back? Do I, get, I, mean, I don't know. He's like right here. I'm like, I, this something's about to go down like right now. And he gets in front of my face. This guy with enormous shoulders out here, no neck. And he goes, he just looks me straight in the eye. I'm like, uh-oh. And, and he goes, hey, Holmes, thanks for sharing, man. And he, and he started to cry because what the Lord did that day just completely broke his heart. And I'm like, wow, that's beautiful. I, I didn't make something up. I just said, God, I, I'll go in your authority. I don't even know what it is, but I will go. Do you see what happens when you simply will go? When you will go. But you've got to see it. You've got to feel it. You've got to be willing to step into the work, and you'll have some stories to tell. You'll be part of God's solution. It's really, really uh, amazing. The harvest is plentiful. There are more waiting than you know. There are more waiting around you than you know. Ready to come more than you can imagine. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit us at valleymetrochurch.com.